Our presenter this week is Henry Picciotto. Um, I know of him through the internet, which is an amazing place. Um, he is nationally famous, which I can attest to because I first heard of him when I lived in New York, and that's not here. Um, but he's from the Bay Area and has done a million education, math education related things in the Bay Area that I'm not going to go on to list because there's so many of them. Um, the, the My favorite things that Henry has done that I love the most are um, all of the things in that algebra book that you wrote, which saved my life during my first year teaching Algebra 1 because those kids would have had such boring experiences that had no relation to anything they'd ever done before, but I found this wonderful book that was full of amazing problems and manipulatives. So um, I'll stop talking, and Henry can start, and welcome. So um, a lot of what I'm going to say you can actually read at your leisure uh, don't leave, but, <laughs> but you, can, you can read at your leisure on my website. Um, so I will show you a link to this list of links. And, uh, and uh, thus there is no paper to hand out. So uh, yeah, this talk is about reaching the full range of students. Um, it's, uh, it's well known that it's difficult to reach a wide range of kids who are in the same class. And um, over the years I've come up with a number of answers and I'll share a couple of those. Uh, I'm sort of happy to be here. Um, I've spoken at Tolman a few times uh, over the years. I've lived in Berkeley since my student days in 19, late 60s, early 70s. And uh, I met my wife in this building. <laughs> we were taking a math class together. And, uh, but what's exciting about this particular visit is I got a parking permit. <laughs> so, 40 years in Berkeley, I got to park on campus for the first time. <laughs> so anyway, uh, maybe not as exciting to you. <laughs> so, so this is the, the question that I'm going to try and address. Uh, what can we do about the fact that kids learn math at different rates from each other? Um, <clears throat> what I'm not going to talk about not much, is the standard responses, uh, one of which is tracking the kids into different classes. So you have the old-fashioned way was um, remedial classes, normal classes, and honors classes, say. Uh, a more contemporary version, you know, is, is uh, I mean, the word remedial is now not used, but it's st still the same idea, and the problem with that approach is that it works pretty well for the upper tracks, doesn't work so well for the lower tracks. Uh, those, are, those classes are much harder to teach. And, uh, and uh, in addition to that, it's really hard to switch levels. So ki kids' entire, they get a life sentence in seventh grade, uh, where a teacher who deems themselves able to make such predictions decides this is a, uh, a regular kid. This is an honors kid. And the reality of adolescence is kids change a huge amount between 7th and 12th grade. And it's kind of arrogant and ridiculous that their whole future <laughs> is determined by a well-intentioned 7th grade math teacher. Anyway, so tracking I do not favor, uh, but it's, that's how it's usually done. Uh, another traditional answer to that question is, uh, is acceleration. But that, there there's not even, like with tracking, there's a claim that it works well for everyone. Uh, because you wouldn't want the weaker students to get depressed uh, being in a class that's too hard for them. And you wouldn't want the stronger students to be bored in a class that's too easy for them. With acceleration, it's more frank. It's all about the top students. It's not relevant to anybody else. And the idea is to push them 
And uh, so uh, the idea is like, let's do a lot fast and superficially, rather than sort of take and go for depth of understanding. And, uh, and that, that works for a very small number of kids. There are more kids, by far, more kids are accelerated than kids who really should be accelerated. I mean, I think accelerate one year, okay, but, but you have sort of absurd situations with 10th graders taking BC calculus, and there's a certain type of kid who will just absorb information fast, reproduce it on the quiz, and quickly forget it, and they can work through this. Most, many of these kids don't even do any more math once they've done whatever is required at a young age. So anyway, that's a whole other topic I'm not going to get into. And then the third, and probably most fashionable now, is differentiation, which when I was a beginning teacher was called individualization. And the idea is that you kind of tailor what you're teaching uh, you know, to each kid. And like all these things, it's, it's well-intentioned, but it's got some problems. First of all, it's a lot of work for a teacher because you're teaching, instead of teaching one class, you have to be teaching many classes within each class, uh, sort of keeping track of what to offer each kid. And uh, in my personal experience, the stronger students really resent it because why do they have to do this extra hard stuff? Um, and uh, so anyway, and it totally makes it hard, if not impossible, for, for students to work in groups and, and uh, to help each other out. So anyway. Uh, what I'm going to present is other answers. I'm not saying, we're not rejecting those, you know, these approaches 100%. There are probably times and places where, to some extent, you should use them. But, but in general, what I'm going to propose, I think, applies really to any situation. Um, even a supposedly tracked class is heterogeneous. There's no, there's no way to have a class where all the kids are the same. So. Uh, so my, uh, uh, <coughs> approach is based on a few <coughs> big ideas. First one is uh, acknowledging this issue that some kids learn math faster than others uh, is uh, alliance with the stronger students. Without that alliance, you're dead in the water. They have to be on your side. Um, at the same time, you have to support the weaker students. And a lot of people who are nicer than I am only worry about the weaker students because the other ones will take care of themselves. That's a big mistake, even though it comes from a nice place. Uh, because uh, the strong students are key in three ways. Politically, if you're not serving your strong students, you're going to hear from their parents. You're going to hear from your administrators. They are, the, they are the thing that they live for. The parents, because it's their own kids. The administrators, for various reasons. They need to get kids into their school. They need to get, you know, they, 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 they are scared of, the, of those parents. Those parents are often the ones who are most active. So, so even for no other reason, <laughs> politically, you need to, 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 to care about your top students. Philosophically, they're kids like every other kid. They deserve to, be, to, to have an interesting class. Moreover, they are likely to be the next, among, among them are the next generation's math teachers. It's in no one's interest to not challenge them. So, third reason is pedagogically. They are the engine that can drive your class. Um, <coughs> you know, through collaborative work and so on. So, so, um, so for all these reasons, your top students are super important. Uh, so I, I believe in what I call the Goldilocks strategy, that every day, every week, every term, I want to do some stuff that's too difficult. Uh, this way, I'm not going to get the kid who says, oh, this class is boring. Because then I can say, well, what about this? What about that? What about the third thing? You, you know, you couldn't do those things. But, you know, 
get, get to it. And then something that's too easy. There's no reason to not include stuff that's too easy. Why not? What it does is that it helps the, the students who are not as quick engage. And, uh, and, uh, and then, you know, the worst advice I got when I was a young teacher was teach to the middle. That was terrible advice. Another way to think of it is, you know, an elevator. You want to stop on all the floors. You know, do ask questions that are too easy, ask questions that are too hard, and everything in between. So anyway, so that's part of my uh, my philosophy, and that sort of translates itself into finding rich problems and activities. Um, so some jargon for this is low threshold, high ceiling. Uh, things that are easy to get started but can go far and deep. Uh, anyway, uh, or local Bay Area jargon, group worthy. Uh, stuff that's worth interesting enough to do in a group rather than just routine. Uh, <coughs> and really, my, that, that's been the driving force in my career, looking for these rich problems and activities. And so it's nice when I hear from people like Anna that this helps. Uh, but that's not today's talk. Today's talk, I'm going to present two other uh, components to, to working with a wide range of kids. First one is what I call extending exposure. Um, the, the tension is your, your stronger students, their self you know, uh, image depends a lot on going fast. Uh, this is what their parents value, this is what the culture values, and, and, and to some extent it's legitimate, it's, you know, you don't, it's not right for them to, you know, have to sit through the, the millionth iteration of something. Uh, you need to have constant forward motion. That's part of the alliance with your top students. But, at the same time, you need eternal review. There's no uh, it, it, it's, not, uh, it's not right that we're done with this unit, you didn't get it, that's tough. That's, our job as teachers is we want to teach everybody, so you, we're not done, we're never done. So the kid who comes up and says, how long are we going to be doing logarithms? I say, oh, forever. You know, <laughs> because they, what the real meaning of their question is, can I just flunk this next quiz and be done with this thing? If you get the message that no, that you're going to have to learn this, that forces a different attitude. Um, so anyway, but how do you, is it even possible to do both of these things? The constant forward motion, the eternal review. I'm going to give you very concrete um, ideas on how this could be done. And I know many of you are not teachers. Bear with me. This you're interested in education, so <laughs> uh, plus it'll give you something to. So research should you be looking for a topic. Uh, <clears throat> so, lagging homework. This is a little known technique that's actually very powerful. Uh, the idea so, is a topic that could conceivably be done in a week. Work on it in class in, during the first week. Don't give homework on it. Instead, save the homework, lag the homework, do that the following week. So you've already doubled the student's exposure. Uh, you, you've already done two things. For the student who wants forward motion, you're already in week two, you're already moving on to another topic. I mean, obviously, this is oversimplified, but we have time to explain the principle of it. Uh, but for the student who needs more time, they get to work on, it, on, on homework. Week three, you give a quiz while the homework is on you know, the next topic. Week four, uh, at my school, we used to call these quiz recycles, meaning uh, quiz corrections. So we've now done four weeks on that topic without taking any extra time. You know, this is just, you're, you're going to have to do homework anyway. You're going to give a quiz anyway. You should do quiz corrections. So you can do these things anyway, but you can stretch them out over four weeks and move on to your next topic and stretch that one out over four weeks. So, okay, so that's method number one to extend exposure. Uh, <clears throat> method number two 
use cumulative tests and other assignments. So um, it's a mistake to just do a unit test. I mean, there's a place for like a unit quiz or whatever, but you also need uh, tests where, I mean, basically what, what I do is, or, or did, I'm now retired. But anyway, what I did was, um, if a lot of people did, did something wrong on a quiz, I tried to give reasonably difficult quizzes because that gives you more information. If a lot of people got something wrong, I'd say, oh man, you guys really messed up on this, it's gonna be on the next quiz. <laughs> so that encourages a serious attitude about the quiz corrections. And, uh, and uh, again, it extends the exposure. Okay, this is even less well known, and yet it's brilliant. Um, separating related topics. So I have a list here, you know, which hopefully ranges over many grade levels. For example, you teach proportional relationships and you teach dilation. Those are intimately related. Separate them by many weeks. You know, linear functions, systems of equations, exponents, scientific notation, tangent, sine and cosine, exponentials, logarithms, sequences, series, all these things two very closely related topics separated by many weeks. You have no idea how powerful that is. Uh, what happens is that when you're doing the second one, it forces review of the first one. But it's not boring because we have to review this because we're doing something new. So we, again, we get the forward motion and we get the review, both things for the price of one. So, uh, why doesn't everybody know this? I don't know. But it, it, it's, it, the, see, the, the belief is the opposite. The belief is we should jump on you know, sine and cosine because we just did tangent. Um, in fact, that, that particular one is a bad example because all three are usually taught at once, big mistake. Uh, but uh, you know, but, uh, exponents and scientific notation. Okay, we, we just did exponents, let's do scientific notation. It, it, you know, it feels right because Let's do it while they still know it. It's an admission that they're not going to know it. So, so uh, if that's your attitude, why are you even a math teacher, right? I mean, the, the, on the other hand, if you decided we'll do, the, we'll do scientific notation in a few weeks, that means that the kids who still know exponents will get a review. And the kids who had only got it partially and didn't really sink in and so on get another chance. So anyway, this is, again, forward motion and review at the same time. And finally, another way to extend exposure is to extend it outside the classroom. And uh, so at my school, I, I was department chair and I was noticing kind of a weird gender thing. The women in my department were showing up super early to meet with kids and help them and then staying late to help, with, to help kids and help them. And the guys just came on time and left on time. So I instituted Math Cafe, which is during lunch, we all take turns. <laughs> and uh, so it, it, there's a system, it's fair, everybody's doing their share of supporting outside of class. Kids know where to get help. They don't have to kind of pressure a, 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 a friendly teacher, they, they know there's a place where they can just show up. So anyway, I mean, many schools have that kind of outside of class support. I think it's super important. So, okay, so everything I've said uh, is based on this forward motion, eternal review concept. And, uh, and uh, it, A, it takes no more time. So they, they, there's no excuse to not do those things. It's not, you can't say, oh, but I don't have time, which is, usually the answer given by many teachers about any suggestion. Um, and, uh, but in this case, it doesn't apply. It does not take more time. Um, and a uh, fashionable thing now is growth mindset. This says to the student, I trust that you're gonna learn it. I'm not gonna give up on you. You don't learn it this week, you learn it next week. You don't learn it next week, you learn it the week after. And in course evaluations, I can't tell you over my decades of doing this, how many kids said, 
oh, I learned, you know, what helped you learn? In the evaluations, I always get, what did you enjoy to get that out of the way? And what helped you learn? Because for kids, it's hard to distinguish those two. <laughs> anyway, but what helped you learn? So many kids said doing the test corrections. In other words, doing it in class, then doing it as homework, then taking the, preparing for the quiz, taking the quiz. Oh, none of that was enough, but the test corrections, you know, got them, got them past that. So anyway, so, so uh, it it's, it's tells the kid, you can learn this. Okay, so all this is important and helpful and fairly easy to implement. It's not easy in that it, you know, you have to make some changes, but it's easy compared to what I'm about to present next, <laughs> uh, which is a tool-rich uh, pedagogy. So uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, I'm going to present three types of tools. Manipulatives. Um, you know, these are sort of hands-on. And, and I, I taught elementary school for about 10 years before teaching high school. So I, I had no preconceptions. Uh, I came to high school and I thought, oh, I can do these cool lessons using pattern blocks. And so, so I'm, uh, you know, I bring out the pattern blocks. And so you have these students who want to look very adult who are coming in, you know, with their makeup and their heels and so on. And they see the pattern blocks. <laughs> Kindergarten blocks! <laughs> you know? And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, this was high school. But, but you know, it, just that is kind of worth it. That, that they, they're coming in and they're excited. You know, this is going to be fun today. I never say it's going to be fun. But in their mind, pattern blocks, how, how could you go wrong? You know, and uh, so this is an early lesson. Can figure out the angles if we know that all the way around is 360 degrees and so on. So uh, many many high school teachers think that kids know what angles are because they're in high school. You know, then they try and teach them to use a protractor, a kid that can't figure out what you're talking about. That's because they don't know what an angle actually is. <laughs> Doing activities of this type, you know, helps. But you can also do some fairly sophisticated things. So look at this. Uh, Thailand here, you have, uh, you have so interesting lessons about symmetry are possible there. Uh, there's a great lesson about uh, if there was a pi, you know, we have pi for circles, but what if there was a pi for regular polygons? Uh, and as it turns out, you would need a perimeter pi and an area pi, you know, those are two different pi's. But, you know, so you can figure it out for triangles, you know, squares, and so on. Turns out, uh, the, the area pi for dodecagons, here's the dodecagon, uh, is exactly three. Is that cool or what? But anyway, <laughs> and, and as you're, and as you're, uh, uh, and of course, the more size, the closer it gets to the real pi. Uh, but anyway, so that's a really interesting lesson, and in the course of it, there's interesting connections with uh, with the, the sine, the double angle formula for the sine. What I'm trying to say is that manipulatives both provide an environment to introduce ideas that are very basic, but if you have some imagination, <laughs> you can also use them to teach some more sophisticated stuff. Uh, here's another example. Uh, these are pentominoes. They're probably, they're certainly among the most popular recreational math <coughs> topics. And so here's a, one of them with its dimensions doubled. So instead of one inch, this is two inches and so on. So interestingly, it takes four pentominoes. They all have equal area. You double the dimensions, you need four to cover it. So that's an interesting and hard to learn for some reason math fact. Uh, and so, so I had students double and triple pentominoes. High school geometry class, there's no time for this, absolutely. And yet, uh, so we did, we did a whole lesson where they had to double the dimensions, solve the puzzle, triple the dimensions, solve the puzzle. They choose whichever one they want. And then they color it. 
high school. And I, they still enjoy coloring. They color it, they put it on the wall, the parents come from, for back to school night. <laughs> so, but interestingly, here's a similar situation with other shapes. These are called the supertangrams. So here's the original shape. Here's the shape with double the dimensions, four times the area. And then here's the shape with double the area. So what's the scaling factor? How, how did, you know, it's clearly it's similar. So that's an interesting exploration. It, you know, it's, uh, square root of 2. Or here is um, some uh, uh, algebra manipulatives. So uh, make a rectangle with these blocks. And uh, there it is. So, so length times width equals area, 2x times x plus 2. So at the beginning level, you know, if you've, especially like if you've taught middle school, but it's still true for some kids in high school. 2x, x plus 2, x squared, it's kind of the same thing. You know, yeah, I see a lot of heads now. <laughs> People have actually dealt with kids. Yeah, no, it's true. And, and, but in this environment, those, those mistakes drop away pretty quickly because, because here's x plus 2. Here's 2x, they don't even look alike. You know, and, uh, and then here's x squared, one of these is x squared. So it's a powerful image for beginners. But then here's a more advanced lesson. Um, these are all rectangles involving x squared and eight x's. And then these are the same blocks rearranged to try and make a square. And these are the graphs of those expressions, of those, you know, y equals x squared plus eight x this and so on. So it's kind of interesting to try and see the connections between these images. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm going to rush through this, but that, like, just uh, mostly you don't have to learn this now, but I'm just trying to make a point about, about manipulatives. Um, so what's going on is, for example, look at the y-intercept, zero, 7, 12, that's the yellow blocks there. Um, because, see over here we have, the, if the, the, x, the, the x and the x squared, if x is 0, what's left is the yellow blocks, so that's the 7. And for this one, if, you're, if the x is 0, what's left is the yellow blocks, that's the 12, 2 times 6, and so on. And interestingly, that last one, uh, is, is a perfect square, and, uh, and we have it up here, 0, 16 for our intercept. But the x-intercepts are also in there. In this case, there's only one. When y is 0, x is negative 4. And again, that's visible in this image. And so on. I mean, I, I'm not going to keep going with this, but it's kind of an interesting thing to discuss and think about. And, uh, and, it, and it's a great... Uh, these blocks allow kids to talk about algebra, which is not that easy to get in a classroom because uh, typically you have some kids for whom it's kind of obvious, and you have other kids for whom it's, it's impenetrable, and they, there's no, no place for them to meet and talk. Having the, these blocks gives the stronger kid uh, a, uh, an environment where they can talk to their classmates to explain things. It's a, they, and also, for some stronger kids, this is not easy. In other words, they, are, you know, they already know how to do this on paper. Why do they have to learn it this way? Because this is, a, this is a geometric model. I want you to know this not only by moving symbols on a piece of paper, but also understand the geometry of it. And with Algebra 1 students, geometry has some status because it's next year. So, uh, you know, it, it, it sort of gets, uh, uh, helps get some buy-in. And um, so, so they, I'm invited to a picnic, and they tell me how to get there. You know, go south on MLK, left on Alcatraz, right on College, left on Keith, then you'd be a stop sign, then a stoplight, make a left on Broadway. 
we'll get in the right lane, then you'll see the overpass. So this is how too much teaching happens. We tell the kids, well, if you see something that looks like this, you need to distribute. But if you see something that looks like that, um, you should you know, move the axis to the other side. But wait, wait, if you see, and so we give them these like impossible to remember instructions. And, uh, and ideally, what we, when we're solving an equation, we're not using any of these methods. We just know how to do it. We just do it. So how do we get from the, this kind of GPS approach to just knowing? Like, you know, now if I'm invited to a picnic at Lake Temescal, I don't have to sort of remember these directions. I just know how to get there because I've lived in Berkeley for 40 years. So, so, uh, so the, the manipulatives provide the map. In other words, the map is in between. It's not giving you step-by-step uh, -step directions. Because the directions approach, if there's something in the way, you're screwed. Um, you know, the, like, you know, the street is, is blocked. What are you going to do? Your, your instructions told you to go that way. Uh, if you have a map, you can say, oh, here's an alternate route. So it's a, it's a, it's a thinking tool. And uh, so anyway, so, so um, this, this ends my plug for manipulatives in high school. Technology is another tool that, that can be used. For, it can do these three things. It can make things more visual. It can make things more interactive. It can make things more creative. I mean, many of these things are still also true in the case of manipulatives, but, but they're uh, definitely true in terms of uh, with, with, uh, with technology. And, and technology, for at least for a long time, was easier to fund research into for some reason. But anyway, uh, so visual, interactive, creative. So here's an example of making something visual where some of the angles add up, so you know, triangle, if, you know, add up to 180 degrees, a little animation. Uh, actually, a better way to do this is to do it after having done the experiment by cutting a paper triangle, tearing the corners, rearranging them, and noticing that every kid's triangle, even though they're all different, it worked for all of them. And, but then it's kind of a nice follow-up to see it on the screen. Or here's an example from, uh, you know, about completing the square. So it's not unrelated to the, the manipulatives that I was showing you. So x times x, this, this is x squared. B times x is this area here. So, so this whole thing is x squared plus bx. And uh, for in for in many situations, it's convenient to complete the square. And uh, let's see how that works. Take your bx, break it into two equal pieces, and then add the square. And there you have it. So you need to take b over 2 and square it. Anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's a... Uh, a visual support. Again, by itself, it's not that great. But if you've done the work with the manipulatives, it's a good way to review it, have the kids sort of uh, do this and write their, uh, their explanation. Okay, interactive. Uh, look at, this is the volume of my, of my pyramid. It's not changing right now. But it's changing now. <laughs> So when I move the, the, the what's that called, the apex in this plane that's parallel to the base, it doesn't change the, the volume. But when I change the base, <coughs> it, you know, the volume changes. And uh, this doesn't prove anything, but it, you know, it leads us to conjecture that the, the, the height of the apex is, is key. And then here is a... Uh, Having this software allows you to kind of look at this um, this prism from different points of view, and uh, that's very hard to do without software. Um, you can have like one pyramid, 
uh, you know, that you built or you bought, but it's just one. Here we can change all, everything and see, see how this works. And so this can lead to, to, to a proof of the formula that, that it's actually one third of the prism. Uh, here's another uh, an assignment. You, you uh, give the kids all these designs, and they have to make them using y equals mx plus b. And uh, this is vastly superior to the way it's usually done. The, way, the, the typical thing is graph this. Now graph that. Now, graph this third thing. Now, graph one more. And then, so the kids don't have to do any thinking. They just put in the thing and they graph a bunch of things. And then, what do you notice? So, so for example, for example, look at this example. Graph this, graph this, graph this, graph this. What do you notice? Or, or even better with this one. They're moving left. That's not what I wanted you to notice. You know, so then there, it, it becomes, it becomes, uh, they're trying to guess what you want them to notice. That's not math. I mean, it's, it's interesting, but it's not math. Uh, so, uh, but this approach where they have to make something, uh, that, first of all, that it's not that competitive in terms of like which one are you on, because they can do them in any order, and they could be trying one thing and getting another and take credit for it. So, so there's a lot of, uh, a, you know, a lot of paths through this activity. And once you get one, it helps you get another. And you're not done because you want them to also write this up, to, you know, make it stick. Um, so typically, I've done this as a review of the MX plus B business, followed by, uh, you know, they have this on a piece of paper, they cut all the pieces and uh, tape them on another piece of paper and write down next to each one how it's done. And uh, even better if they can write it using uh, parameters. <coughs> so, um, anyway, so, so this, is the, this is the idea of, um, so some people call this, um, I occasionally read stuff like that, rarely, but sometimes. So apparently some people could call this construction, constructionism, as, put, as different from constructivism. It probably means something to you. Not so much to me. But yeah, you know, you have to construct, make something. So, uh, or here, here's a you know playing around with with uh, with the geometry software. Uh, my first assignment with geometry software is. I mean, I worked in a in a privileged school where every kid had a laptop, so the the homework was make anything uh, with the software. And uh, I mean, they probably wouldn't come up with this right away, but they made kind of interesting and amazing things, and they learned a lot about how the software works, and uh, you know, could sort of help each other out. Uh, or look at this. This is uh, this is a, a hard challenge, kind of at the end of a construction unit. Uh, given a point and a line, construct a circle through the point tangent to the line, like the one you just saw. So this is not that easy to do, and most US math teachers actually don't seem to know how to do this. Uh, I learned by doing workshops. Um, but uh, it, it's kind of interesting, and it, it has kind of the, a, a really cool payoff, which is it, you, can, uh, you can find that, that the center of that circle uh, traces a parabola, depending on, depending on where you put your, your tangent circle. And so here's the parabola. And that's because the center is equidistant from the directrix and, uh, and the focus. And so, uh, so it's a, a geometry algebra connection. Geometry students who get this just flip out because it's so cool. And uh, so anyway, uh, so technology used well allows for a lot of stuff and it's likely that it's going to get used more because of um, tablets being a lot cheaper than laptops and and uh, and so, so hopefully it'll reach more kids now uh, many um, many sort of parents and some 
mathematicians object to, to technology because it's a crutch. Uh, and I hope they don't break both legs uh, because they probably would need some crutches. Uh, the, I've had students, you know, I, I, I talked, most of my career has been in private schools. Um, I was at the urban school in San Francisco for 32 years. Uh, so our students were not <coughs> exclusively, but mostly fairly well-off white kids. For those kids, nobody tells them you can't take math because you, you're, you're not good in arithmetic. <coughs> nobody would even think of it. The idea is, these are rich white kids, they're going to take math. So I've had plenty of students who couldn't do six, plus, six times seven without pulling out their calculator. Who got a B in <coughs> pre-calculus? Would it have made sense to say, if you don't know your multiplication table and how to add fractions, you're not allowed in this class? No, it would not make sense. I let these kids use the calculator whenever they want. What, what's lost? Um, you know, all, all you're doing, and this is kind of a punitive view of technology, that it's only for the rich kids. And it's only, um, you know, it's a way, instead of technology being to help students, it's a way to discriminate among students. Uh, that makes no sense to me. So, um, anyway, so manipulatives, technology, uh, part of my tool rich pedagogy. And then there's other tools that are just sort of um, pencil paper, really. Um, but add to, to our, uh, our repertoire. Uh, for example, it's, it's well known that you can study functions as, uh, you know, numerically looking at tables. Uh, the, these points here are the graphs of those points that are listed here. And, uh, and then you can also do it with a function diagram. We have an expert on this here. Uh, and um, the, and, and um, it, it's not as good, the, the function diagram does not have the, the power uh, of the Cartesian graph uh, where we can, for example, show all the points between here and here. Here it would be a mess if we showed all the points. And it's a very powerful educational tool. It's a really hard sell. Uh, in my <coughs> own department, it took years to convince my colleagues that this was a good idea. But it's a good idea. <laughs> you know, the, uh, once you start using it, you realize it's a great way to teach a whole bunch of things. You know, uh, recognizing functions by domain and range. Um, the, I mean, I, I personally never understood the chain rule in calculus. I mean, I applied it, I was good at it, but it always seemed kind of bizarre. Why do you multiply when it's a composition? It's like, you know, and the, I mean, I assume I saw a proof you know, done by a teacher at a chalkboard, but it never made any sense to me until function diagrams make it crystal clear. Anyway, visit my website for more on this. Uh, but, so the idea is more tools is better. Uh, or this, the 10 centimeter circle. Uh, we give kids copies of this uh, where it's a 10 centimeter radius you can, you can find sine, cosine, and tangent by measurement. I mean, you don't even need a ruler because it, everything is marked. <laughs> you know, so, so you can find out uh, all those things. And in fact, we introduce them to sine, cosine, and tangent using this without even using the words, saying, uh, for example, the tangent. For, in, for a given slope, there's an angle, right? Because a bigger slope would be a bigger angle. Let's find out for a bunch of angles what the slopes are a bunch of slopes, what the angles are. And then we can solve, you know, these, these typical uh, uh, right triangle trick problems, like how, how high is the flagpole, you know, these kinds of problems, uh, without a calculator, by just using our 10 centimeter circle to measure and find sine, cosine, or tangent. So, uh, okay, well, so these were the, 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 the tools. Um, but here's the bad news, tools are not magic. Uh, when I was younger and more naive, I was under the impression that if the kids like, worked on it with their hands, they would know it. 
Well, it's not that easy. Uh, that's just that's part of the. It's it's helpful, the, but but it's not magic. And moreover, they can be misused. Any of these tools can be misused. Um, for example, the algebra manipulatives can be an extra thing for kids to listen to you uh, on how to do it. That's just that that's counterproductive. They, they already have too many things to listen to you for. Uh, and then uh, you know I mentioned the what do you notice kind of misconception. Uh, so. So as far as I'm concerned, the idea of tools is A, it helps you shift the center of gravity into the class, into, among the students. You're, when kids are working with manipulatives or with technology or whatever, you walk around, you know what they're thinking. When you're talking up here, you have no idea what they're thinking. Uh, you know, there's some who are really good at nodding periodically. Uh, it doesn't mean they're listening, but they're good at nodding, you know, and uh, it's a skill. Um, and, and, but if, you're, if you said, make a rectangle, and you, know, you can see from a distance, do they know what's happening? Um, anyway, and then it's also, an, an, as, I, as I've said, it's a kind of an arena for discussion, reflection, putting things into words. You, you have, uh, if, you, if you're dealing with difficult ideas, you need to talk. Uh, you know, my wife knows this well because <laughs> If I'm struggling with something difficult, I will start trying to discuss it with her. And she has zero interest in the question, but she realizes it's important for me to talk. Well, it, it, it's, it's the same for kids. They, you can't learn anything difficult in silence, in my opinion, at least in my culture. But <laughs> anyway, so uh, it, you know, a tool-rich classroom allows for cooperative learning and group work, uh, provides a visual bridge to concepts. And I, I recently, to my dismay, found out that um, there's no such thing as a visual learner. Because uh, I used to say, it's good for the visual learners, but apparently the research shows that that's a myth, that there's no such thing. Nevertheless, I'm not changing my, my teaching because the, everybody needs to, be, to, to develop their visual sense. And, uh, and, and it's, it's been, you know, the, it's been kind of a, a tragedy of American math education that geometry has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking with every, every few years, including with the Common Core. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's a shame because you know, you're, you're losing beauty, you're losing motivation, <laughs> you're, 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 you're reaching the number of people who've told me over the years, oh, I was terrible in math, except geometry, you know. Uh, it, it's, the visual stuff is super important, even if there's no such thing as visual learners. Uh, anyway, and the micro worlds is a concept from the logo movement, which tells you how old I am. Um, uh, that was, uh, you know, at the beginning of, of home computers, the idea was we're gonna teach kids to, to write programs, and that, that's coming back finally. But for a long time, that was kind of not happening. But anyway, but that, that world, uh, you know, one of, one of the concepts was the low threshold, high ceiling. Another concept was micro worlds, like a, a limited universe that you can explore mathematically. All those things are made possible by, by a tool approach. And, you know, it's well known that presenting things from different points of views is, uh, you know, is, is useful. Uh, that's a big difference between an expert and a beginner, is an expert can see things different ways. A beginner tends to only see it one way at first. And uh, so doing many representations, an entry point to more students, a way to preview concepts or to review them without being boring. You know, if you're reviewing the thing the same way you did it the first time, it's not going to help the kid who didn't get it. Doing it the same way will have the same result. So you want to, you know, you want to have multiple ways to do things. Tools allow that. It extends exposure, deepens understanding, and it increases variety. Uh, I had one of my uh, memories from when I was first teaching high school was this girl comes up to me at the end of class. Is every day going to be like this? And uh, I was thinking, oh my god, every day is going to be like this. That's all I know how to do. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, 
it, math class has got to be the most monotonous in a non-tool oriented classroom. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the variety is good. Anyway, so with the tools, you can tell I'm getting close to the end. Tools provide more motivation, um, more access, more challenge, and deeper understanding. But here's the bad news, it's a lot of work. Uh, managing manipulatives is a pain in the neck. They're always getting lost, and so on and so forth. Uh, software, is, there's no end to it. Eh? As soon as you learn one piece of software, it's no longer available. It no longer works on your computer. So, so it's a kind of a lifelong commitment to keep learning new things, which, uh, but in my opinion, it's worth it. But, you know, to be honest, it's a lot more work than the stretching exposure that I was recommending earlier. Okay, last idea. Teaching fewer things makes time for more approaches, tools, and representation, and therefore all the benefits that I mentioned. And uh, what topics do you let go? <laughs> and the bad news, like when, they, when they said, oh, there's going to be common core standards, I thought, core, yes, because I thought it was going to be just like the core. Instead, there are so many standards that the only way to teach them is superficial. So uh, anyway, but that's a different talk. <laughs> so uh, um, here's my conclusion. Teachers should extend exposure and use tools, and academics should research this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is where you can get me. And this leaves us a half hour to talk. So uh, questions, comments, objections? Yeah. I was just wondering, uh, you mentioned that there are, there's research to support the fact that there are no visual learners. I wonder what... Uh, oh, what no, the research, I, I don't know that much about it, but, oh, okay. but uh, the, apparently the, what the research shows is that you, if somebody is deemed to be a visual learner, it turns out they don't learn any faster with visual uh, approaches, that, it, that, that trying to match Trying to match uh, instruction to student uh, assumed, uh, um, you know, learning preference uh, turns out to be not, not effective according to whatever to whoever did that research. I don't. I, my, my whole problem with research is that I don't read most of it. I'm mostly interested in research that confirms my prejudices, <laughs> which is sort of the opposite of what, <laughs> of what <laughs> research is supposed to be about. Um, but I remember one uh, saying this to, to a professor uh, of math education one time. He said, uh, you know, I sort of admitted this. He says, but that's what research is for. <laughs> so there you go. Um, just don't tell the funders. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, so uh, to, the, the, the short answer is I don't actually know that much about it, but apparently it's now well established, according to what I've read, that, that uh, you know, and, and, but I'll tell you, the more important thing is that that whole thing about learning styles um, has one poisonous aspect. The good thing is if it gets teachers to teach many ways, but many ways to all kids. Uh, the bad thing is the kid who says, and I've heard this who knows how many times because I worked in a private school, so the kids had been, you know, several of my students had been kind of analyzed and, and they knew what kind of learner they were. And so they would say, you know, I'm, I'm uh, auditory or I'm visual. If, you know, if, if you don't, you know, if I don't have a visual thing, I can't learn it. So it's kind of a self-limiting thing. Um, and and the, the, I would say, if you know, if you ask me, I would say I'm visual. Uh, but does that mean I shouldn't learn symbol manipulation? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means I like it better, you know. <laughs> so, you know. so uh, that's pretty much my feeling as well. So yeah, I mean, does somebody know about this research? Well, apparently, a little bit. <laughs> so uh, anyway, other other questions, comments? Yeah. Can you please elaborate about the use of the manipulatives as the map for uh, for the students? Wait, the use of manipulatives as a map. As oh, a, as a map. map. Your metaphor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, 
so there's really two types of manipulatives. Mm -hmm. One is manipulatives that exist for their own reason. For example, pentominoes. Pentominoes were not created for education. And so I wouldn't say those are a map. I would say they are, they're a micro world that's, that deserves study and you know, exploration. On the other hand, you have manipulatives that are designed for education, such as base 10 blocks. Uh, those actually do provide a map. So, so for example, um, in kindergarten, kids can uh, count beans, and when they get to 10, they can glue the beans on a, on a lollipop stick. So then they have a 10. And then they can glue the beans on another lollipop stick until they have 10 more, now they have 20. So that's a map of place value in a way. Later, the, it's better to start that way because they've counted the beads. They, they kind of know what's happening. Later, they can understand base 10 blocks better. And that's kind of a better map because we can go 3D uh, with it. So, so it's about connection of some mathematical concept to the concrete man manipulative yes. that you are working with in kindergarten, uh, First grade, middle and, and school, all the way to high school, etc. So they have some uh, associations that are uh, that you are relating on and pointing to this one. Well, the, or that they discovered, mm -hmm. you know, that they experienced and discovered. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So um, the one great moment in, in my uh, teaching algebra one was the kid who came up to me after class and said, "I want to be free of the blocks because." she could do factoring and so on using you know, the algebra blocks, you know, the, the, the lab gear. Uh, and, uh, but she felt that, and she was right, that's not enough. And, and so I, I usually, you know, so I was sort of picturing her marching on Washington, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be free of the blocks. <laughs> anyway. uh, but um, but I, I've, uh, what I usually tell kids is, um, is uh, let's say you become an engineer uh, and then you need to do some algebra as part of your job. So you go, you lock the door, you open your drawer, you take out your lab gear blocks and you work, you know, uh, you, that's not right. You, the, the blocks are, you know, a way to learn the stuff, not the goal. And, um, and in fact, you know, I had I, many years ago, I did a presentation on this very topic about, the, about algebra manipulatives in this very building. And uh, a, 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 an otherwise very smart <laughs> professor of education uh, um, just could not see it. Somebody who's deep into uh, technology, but just you know, could not see how this could be useful. But the, the reality is that teachers who've used this, you know, the number of teachers who've come up to me to say, you know, this saved me, <laughs> you know, uh, many, 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 and, or to put it like, like one of my students, the lab gear saved my butt, <laughs> and uh, the, so, so that, that's the, that's the, anyway, so the, the, sometimes it's a map, sometimes it's a micro world, and, 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 uh, and, and the use, the use as a map, the micro world thing, you can go as deep and as long as you want, the map, really, you have to see that the goal is to let go of it. Um, other comments, questions? Yeah? Uh, I was curious, what, what do you think are, you showed this example of the uh, geometry uh, program where it traces the locus or something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was curious what you would, you would argue the affordances are of first doing it low tech, or doing it low tech, meaning you, you spend a good amount of time just tracing things out for yourself, rather well, than doing it high tech, where it's just doing it for you somehow. Well, first of all, I, I don't accept that, this, that, that, okay. that, that distinction, because um, if you start with a blank screen, it's not doing it, it's doing some things for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the problem I showed you, it doesn't do it for you. I mean, you could, you could say, you know, parabola with this and that, you know, directrix and, and focus. But you can always, and this, is, this has been true since the early days of Logo, you can always tell the students, and they never question it, do this without using that uh, specific tool. So for example, the, the programming example is, 
kids learn how to make a polygon. And, uh, and the software may allow them to make a circle. And you say, now make a circle without using the circle tool. So they have to come up with the idea of a polygon with so many sides that it looks like a circle. Uh, or with, the, with, the, with the, the geometry software, such as GeoGebra, Cabri, and, and all the others, uh, you can say, if I click on two points, it can give me the perpendicular bisector. Get the perpendicular bisector without using that. So, so that becomes a, um, a, a pedagogical question. And my experience is, I mean, I'll give you a totally different example. Uh, teaching systems of equations. Uh, let's say you show students that you can get the solution by intersecting two lines in graphing software. My experience is that makes them want to know how to do it without even more, not less. Uh, because they, they know there must be a way, you know, and they're curious about it. I, I, didn't, I, I guess I didn't answer that question uh, properly because I didn't mean that it was easier to do in the technology. I was just wondering whether you think there may be something lost for not doing it with your hands. Like, no, I think, I, I, okay, I think quite the opposite. Okay. Uh, because I was the student whose uh, compass was flawed. Every time I tried to make a circle, <laughs> it tore the paper. <laughs> you know, other people were making circles, I was tearing paper. And, uh, and then, but also, I had the worst compass in the class. Because it, it, it would always keep changing. It's, 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 well, this happened to you as well. And then when I became a teacher, yeah, 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 the pencil doesn't stay in. Then, then when I became a teacher, it multiplied the problem because all the all the compasses were broken. So, so, uh, so, you know, there are some things. I give the example of the, the the sum of the angles in a triangle. I think something is lost if the kids just see that. Uh, because it's not active. They're just watching it. So for that, I, I start by having them cut out the triangle with scissors, tear the corners, rearrange, see the 180 degrees. Then we do it again with a quadrilateral, see that it makes a, you know, 360 degrees. And then I show them that, that animation. But the distinction is not hands-on. They're both hands-on. They're both technology. They're just different technologies. <laughs> Uh, the, the difference is watching is not very useful. Doing is what, is, that's, that's the difference. So, does that answer? Yeah. Yeah. So you spoke about, I think it was three different chapters you had in your talk, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. And so if we think of this as three-dimensional kind of matrix, I'm interested in some of the intersections between them. And for example, uh, where does alliance with the stronger students meet uh, use of interactive technology? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, I mean, what I was trying to show with the examples I gave um, was that, that uh, do you mind if I just show those images because it'll be easier. Um, I mean, uh, okay, I'm just going to go through these one by one uh, to try and answer your question. So this, this here was about a visual representation of completing the square. My personal experience is that 90% of kids, uh, it's like only 10% for whom that's easy to do uh, just purely by manipulating symbols. It's a very small number. Most of them either just memorize the, the quadratic formula and be, take your word for it that this proves it, <laughs> Uh, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, they, you know, think this is too outside of their reach. So this doesn't actually address your question because <laughs> there's so few kids <laughs> who can do this without the, 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 without the, the blocks and the technology. But um, let me take another example. Look at this example here. Oh, oh, I'm on the wrong screen. Um, hang on, how do we do this? Um, Okay, so look at this. Most of these are straightforward if you know the MX plus B business. So it would be a little insulting for some of my students 
if I didn't put in some monster problems in there. Uh, this is the, the, the TI-80 something version. Uh, doing this right, you, you have to completely have nailed the other things you can guess and, and, and do a reasonable facsimile. To get this right, you have to you know, calculate your, your slopes uh, or it's not going to come out looking as cool. And then this can't be done with y equals mx plus b. You turn the calculator. No. <laughs> uh, I would congratulate you. <laughs> but, no, here's, here's my typical answer. Is I say this to oh yeah, let's skip that one, it's too hard. But you know, somebody last year got it. Anyway. <laughs> and uh, so, so, and it can be done. All you have to do is a high enough slope and it'll look vertical. So, uh, but of course, I don't tell them that. I'm only telling you this because we're in a hurry. Uh, and, uh, and they say, it's impossible. It has to be x equal. I, I say, I know it's impossible. Why did I even put this on there? Uh, no, no, but I'm sure somebody did it. Anyway, um, so, so, uh, if, and, you know, and so, so almost every year, somebody finally sort of gets it. And, and they're really excited. So, so this is an example of something where the same activity serves a very different purpose for the kid who figures this out, and, and this to, to a certain extent, than the kid who needs to learn this and this. You know? So, uh, okay, and then um, the... So if you want to go to the next slide. Okay, so here, the construction of, of, the, of the parabola. Uh, you know, construct a circle tangent to the line through the point. That is very difficult. Like I said, most American teachers don't know how to do this. And, and, and you know, think it, 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 it's too hard and therefore their students can't do it. Uh, in fact, uh, I've done this every time I've taught geometry for year after year after year. And the kid who gets there, they, they are the strongest kids in the class. And the, the previous problems are much more accessible, like make a circle through three points or, or um, you know, make a, a circle tangent on the inside of a triangle and so on. But, you know, eventually they get to this problem. The kid who, who does it is like walking around the room saying, explaining it to other students and feeling totally successful. So this is a kid who would have been bored and insulted if everything that we did with the software was, you know, six times seven, you know. <laughs> so, so so the, the, the tools serve different purposes for different kids. The challenge is coming up with the right activities. So the, 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 that's, the, that's, the, that's the problem with my whole tool-based uh, tool or tool-rich pedagogy, is it only works if you have good curriculum. So go to my website, plenty of good examples. But, but uh, it, it's true. It, well, any tool can be misused. And, uh, and, you know, that's just how it is, <laughs> you know, it's, but, but, uh, but I think good curriculum, you, you can support really good curriculum with tools and reach many more kids, that's all, and, and at no cost to the stronger students who in fact love it. Um, yeah? Um, so I guess the curriculum piece, but I'm wondering, have you ever been asked to teach a topic for which you had or for which it was a struggle to come up with a manipulative or a tool, uh, or like one of these. Well, yeah, yeah, I make it look easy, but you know, I, I, I taught high school for 32 years, and some of these ideas only occurred to me in the 30th year, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, no, it's not that easy. Um, it's easier now because of the internet. Uh, you know, um, you don't have to invent everything. And uh, I mean, it was always true. It's just easier to not have to invent everything nowadays because uh, you can, uh, you know, you, you can find stuff online. And uh, but uh, no, and and so when I have like when I have a, an idea on how, for example, uh, there's a somewhat uh, an approach to teaching the Pythagorean theorem uh, using geoboards. Uh, so early 90s, um, I, uh, I just uh, came up with this idea. 
uh, was instantly attacked by a professor, uh, a UC Davis mathematics professor, uh, who claimed that, uh, uh, what about proof? And my point was, no, you do this to lay the groundwork for proof. But uh, it, basically the idea is you, if you make squares on a geo board that are tilted, you can find their areas by adding and subtracting pieces. Then you can, uh, you do this a bunch of times, that turns out to be the proof of the Pythagorean theorem when you do it with letters. Okay, so I came up with this idea, you know, back, you know, in, in the Stone Age, and, and uh, I was so excited because I had felt like my sort of explaining it on the board just wasn't doing it, and I was really excited. Now this thing is widely done, uh, but, uh, but, you know, Somebody else probably would have thought of it, but you know. But the, the point is that none of this is, is straightforward. You, you, you know, finding, and it goes both ways. One is, like I designed some uh, algebra blocks, the lab gear, based on existing things that people had done before me. Uh, but other things were, I, I, I sort of thought, oh, pentominoes are fun, and then developed lessons using pentominoes, or you know, same with, with pattern blocks and so on. So I think it goes both ways. One is familiarizing yourself with what already exists. The other is trying to think of how would one do this. The second is much harder, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and so here's an example of something that to this day I don't have a good way to teach, uh, laws of exponents. For some reason, kids find that really hard. To me, it's not that hard, but to them, it really is. And I don't have any kind of non-paper pencil, uh, you know, way to, to get a feel for it. Yeah, as soon as things get many-dimensional, it becomes hard to, <laughs> to have models. Uh, so, a good thing to think about in my retirement. <laughs> so, any any other questions? We do have a few more minutes, yeah. So you, you talked about with like the lab gear and stuff, that, that that's not the end goal. Like you don't want your students to be an engineer and then have to pull their lab gear and then work it through. Um, can you talk about the process of like weaning kids off the lab gear? Because like, like a terrible way to do it would be like, all right, now put it away. Now we're here. Yeah, no, I say you can use it as much as you want, including on tests. Uh, and. Really, in decades of doing this, I have yet to have a single student use them on test because getting them, opening the box, it's on the clock is ticking, you know. Uh, but so, for example, the factoring by making a rectangle, uh, we do a bunch in class, and then the homework is draw pictures. So they don't have blocks at home; they have to kind of imagine it and draw draw a picture of it. So that's kind of a step towards more abstraction. If you can do it with drawing a picture, you don't need the blocks. Then, then there's a further step, which is the, you know, showing them how you can do the distributive rule in a in a in a rectangle, so filling all the boxes. You know, two x. I mean, x plus two times two x. You know, you fill in all the blocks. So, so, and that looks exactly like the like the blocks. So it's a it's a multi-step uh, process, which I, you know paid attention to and. Uh, and uh, in, in my later, the, the upcoming edition of my lab gear books, I have pages for the teacher specifically about that question, uh, because that's what people ask. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't tend to say no blocks or no calculator. No calculator sometimes. Uh, um, when I'm, there's a particular thing, like for example, um, Which of these is a likely um, sign for five degrees? And then I give them a bunch of possible answers. They should be able to answer that, you know, a multiple choice of that sort. But if they have the calculator, that's not an interesting question. <laughs> uh, but that would be a good way to reveal do they understand what the sign of an angle is. Uh, so I do no calculator sometimes. I haven't, there, there's no point in saying no manipulatives because it doesn't come up. I mean, you know, either you're doing less on the manipulatives or not. Um, and you do pay attention to the transition away from. Okay, looks like we're, oh, question back there? No. Okay, so I guess uh, this, this ends it. Thank you. Thank you.